Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming back to the show. I'm very pleased to have back on the show today, Dr. Yanir Baryam. If you didn't listen to the third episode of the program, you can go back there and uh, listen to the, the conversation I had with Yanir earlier this year. That'll give you a little more context for this conversation. Uh, Yanir is the founder here of ECV. He's also the president of the New England Complex Systems Institute. And he has founded a new organization for pandemics called the World Health Network. Uh, so we discuss the WHN in this episode. Uh, depending on when we release this, we hope to have it coincide with the, the day. Uh, but uh, either right when this episode airs or just before or just after, uh, they'll be having a article published in The Lancet. should be putting that in the description box for this episode. And that uh, said publication uh, in The Lancet, we discuss in the episode here. And if you want to participate in the World Health Network, they have a summit coming up the second global summit to end pandemics on November 3rd and 4th. To register for that and any other information on it, visit worldhealthnetwork.global. So beyond that, I'll let you dive in and see what Yenir has to say today. I hope you enjoy. Cheers, guys. All right, uh, so let's start off, Yenir. Go over what uh, the World Health Network is and why you got that started. So over the um, first year of the pandemic, what we saw was that there were groups that were forming in many different countries. Um, some of them uh, formed spontaneously, some of them formed as a result of our sending out messages and, and getting people together and, 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 and they started to do things. Um, some of these groups are scientific. Uh, the first one that I know of that formed was the Independent Sage in the UK. Um, but there are groups in many countries around the world. In Latin America, there are multiple groups in um, many European countries, and also in, uh, um, in Asia. And, um, and, and so those groups are mostly focused on clarifying both the science and the policy implications of the science uh, for the public, for the government, um, and, um, uh, trying to um, use the information that science provides to improve the pandemic response efforts. Um, then there are um, community groups, and these include um, community organizers and teams that are engaged in efforts to empower the communities. There are parents groups, there are that are working on trying to improve school safety. Um, and, and these groups also exist around the world, US, Europe, um, and many other places. And um, it seemed clear at some point that, you know, I was talking with many of these groups, but they weren't aware of each other. They weren't able to leverage each other's actions. Um, and so I began to think about what would be a structure that would enable them to communicate with each other, to support each other, to grow their efforts. Um, and, and that uh, began the process of creating the World Health Network. And so the World Health Network is really um, the result of a thought process, not to create something for itself, but to create a, a, a system that can support um, all of the efforts around the world that are designed to promote 
more effective pandemic response, to protect lives, to protect health of people, and to support people in this time of, of deep crisis. Um, and I can, I can say a few things about the different parts of it, but maybe you have some other questions. Oh, no. Fire away. So there is, it's clear that there is, there is a general need for science information. So there's need for some foundation in science. And we had the COVID action group, which had expanded from a U.S.-based group to being a global group. And so we expanded it further to include more international, more global representation. And so that's the scientific foundation of the World Health Network. And then um, we are um, working on community activities, empowering communities to either do work on DIY efforts like ventilation, creating their own ventilation uh, boxes, the Cor Corsi Rosenthal boxes, or advocacy for community for child safety, or um, other things that people can uh, do for their own safety. And then there are, again, the scientific groups that we are working to support both by providing um, a global network of people that can be consulted with uh, and uh, relevant scientific reference documents like uh, guidelines for ventilation or other things um, that are important to have in the context of local communication efforts. And more generally, we are working on creating an environment where people can learn about each other, interact, strengthen their own activities, and strengthen others' activities by the complementarity that exists among the groups, as well as the synergy that exists in terms of shared action. And in that context, we've developed these uh, projects, projects that people can uh, work on. And, and by joining the World Health Network, people can come together. We have a, a next generation virtual platform uh, based upon uh, the uh, OEA platform. It's a fully customized space that can be adapted to the meetings that we want to organize, the social events, or the uh, uh, ability to uh, make resources available to the community. Now, we're recording this in, in advance, but this will be coming out to, to coincide with this. But uh, through WHN, you have the declaration uh, being published in, in Lancet. So go over what's in the declaration and what you want accomplished through it. So the declaration is a statement of purpose and of intention. Um, uh, what we can say is that the, um, uh, the, the basic framing um, is that on the one hand, we see that there's been fundamental failure of a government response resulting in huge loss of life huge economic impacts and, and huge loss of freedom in a context where we know that it could have been, much of that could have been prevented, right? So we pointed at the prevention of that and, and end coronavirus was created, you know, right at the beginning, at the end of February, beginning of March of 2020. Um, and we knew at that moment that things were not going to go well because the decision of governments to accept the virus coming into countries of the West was happening at that moment. And the alternative of preventing the virus from even arriving was possible. Right. Taiwan demonstrated, even though they're so close to China, 
that it was possible to stop it. And, and much of the tragic uh, sequel of allowing the virus to, to come could have been prevented. And in particular, you know, we now know that not only did we suffer from the original variant, but now there are more severe variants, the Delta and so on. We've been combating multiple waves. We've had to do lots of things. We've had to do lockdowns and travel restrictions and everything that people thought that they couldn't do. And what we know is that if we'd acted at the beginning, the action would have been very limited and very short duration because by stopping it from arriving in much of the world, the focus of attention could have been on eliminating it from the places where it uh, had already arrived. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, and as a result, we've had the pandemic history that we have. So the, the declaration starts by saying the COVID-19 pandemic has cost over 4 million lives, 5 million basically at this point, um, left millions of people with persistent symptoms long COVID and has devastated societies with already disadvantaged communities being hit the hardest. The tragedy is that much of this harm was preventable as shown early on by many Asia Pacific countries that pursued elimination of COVID-19 and protected both their public health and economies. And this is next the crux. The rest of the world can still work toward elimination. The World Health Network is a coalition of citizens and experts who are committed to global action to protect public health through protect progressive elimination of COVID-19. So the point is that we have an ongoing challenge. The ongoing challenge is not the one we want to have, but it's the one that we have. We don't get to choose the past. The only choice, the only question is whether we will actively choose the future. And, and what it means to pursue elimination is basically to treat it like we treat fires, whether house fires or wildfires, which means to reduce it dramatically as fast as possible to achieve the minimal conditions and then to progressively eliminate it across the world and hopefully over time to achieve eradication, which is a much greater goal, but surely the goal of elimination is eminently achievable in much of the world. And, and that's what we should do. The, the declaration goes on to point to the reasons that this has been a challenge. That there are these vested interests that have short-term thinking about economics. We can see now the tremendous economic impacts of allowing the disease to run rampant. Um, we see increasingly challenges that are um, could have been prevented, but now there is disruption of supply chains, the global supply chains. There are labor market uh, challenges for business. And, and people, again, see these as being short-term issues. And somehow they don't understand that the solution to all of them is to restore safety, safety for individual lives um, and prevent the ongoing harm uh, to individuals. People will not accept this idea that they can simply go around doing their regular pre-pandemic lives. It's not the way things work. And even if they did, the harm that they would uh, encounter, the disease that would put them in hospitals, the brain damage that it would cause, the physical harm, the creating other you know, long-term disability, all of that cannot be ignored. Mm -hmm. And, and whether people take the precautions or don't take the precautions, both cause tremendous harm. And um, indeed, 
it is not possible to think about the kind of pre-pandemic lifestyle um, as a persistent uh, quality of, of, civil, of society without uh, recognizing that elimination is the way to get there. So we have this challenge. We didn't ask for it, um, but we don't have a way to um, pretending that it doesn't exist doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, the short-term thinking, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Some of it is random, but a lot of it is an organized effort um, to misinform. Uh, there are key uh, properties of what's going on. The disease is airborne. We have to deal with that effectively. The children are infected. We cannot pretend they're not. We need to recognize that face masks have tremendous uh, power to stop transition, transmission and ventilation is important. All of those things are key aspects of what is an effective response. Um, and there are assumptions and beliefs that are somehow uh, harmful. They're simply untrue. That includes exceptionalism. Um, somehow the idea that we won't in one place be affected by something that's happening in another place. That a disease that infects people in China will somehow be mild in another place. It will not affect us because of some qualities of the society that are either um, imagined or even real, uh, but they're not going to stop this disease. Um, and ultimately, the, the recognition of these things means that we have to take action in the face of uncertainty and not adopt policies, whether individual, or the country, particularly not the country, that are based on, on, on choosing the, the facts that we want to believe. Maybe they might be true. It's not good enough. Uh, the important thing is to respond to the, to the challenges that we're really facing. Uh, you know, the, when an individual pretends that they can uh, walk across a highway without danger, because that's what their mind is telling them, mm -hmm. the situation is not good. And, and as a society, but also as individuals, we really have to confront the reality that we're facing. And, and, and one of the big uh, failures has been um, the wishful thinking around um, the, the existence of an easy solution. Um, the one which is, if anything, the best of the tools that we have come up with since the beginning of the pandemic is vaccination. And while vaccination is a powerful tool, it has not proven to be a solution. In a different world, with a different disease, with a different circumstance, with a different whatever, with a different willingness of people to be vaccinated, whatever are the imagined properties, um, it might have been a solution. But with the virus that mutates, with people that are hesitant, with the efficacy of the vaccines that we have, um, whatever are the properties that are the real world properties that we are confronting, it hasn't been a solution. And we have to confront that. We have to confront the reality we have because the consequences are determined by the reality, not by our wishful thinking picture, which somehow would be the truth if we were in a um, in a in a in a movie mm -hmm. uh, fantasy. So um, so ultimately, what we need to do is to get together collectively. Nobody can do this individually. They cannot solve the problem by themselves. So we have to work together with scientists and, and, and healthcare workers and educators and all the people who can be professionals, but also with the people who have the experience with the disease to inform us 
because people don't want the the statistics are not what's most important. It's realizing that it's real people who are suffering, and that we need to um, uh, protect others uh, from that those fates. And and it's important to realize that you know the getting infected is irreversible. Mm-hmm. Um, once you're infected, you can't never have been infected. The, the disease does harm. But, but in addition to that, being infected once doesn't mean you won't be infected again. People, again, have this wishful thinking based upon other diseases that you get infected once and you don't get infected again. It's not true for COVID. Both people are reinfected by the same variant, but more frequently by other variants. Um, it's, it doesn't, the, the idea of immune protection, which is a nice uh, textbook idea, doesn't apply to COVID. So, so the World Health Network has a wide variety of different people, skills, capabilities, and communities around the world. And we are engaged in trying to make the reality clear and promote the shared effort uh, to get rid of this virus and to improve our lives. Um, 100 years ago, hundreds of years ago, life was much less safe. Mm -hmm. And the ability to rely on being alive in a few days or in some friend or relative being alive was very low compared to what we've experienced in the immediate pre-pandemic period. And that's because we devoted a huge amount of effort to to ensuring safety, Um, safety in in, um, uh, from getting disease, safety from from harm of products that are being produced, whether it's poisons or whether it's uh, unsafe, things that uh, we use or live in, buildings. Um, we, we worked a lot on improving the safety of our lives. And uh, right now, we have given up a lot of that. And, and that diminishes the value of life in, 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 in our minds and in our actions. Uh, and it uh, has consequences, of course, in terms of what kind of life we can live. So, so that's what the World Health Network is. Um, again, there are lots of projects that people can get involved in that we're doing. Um, um, a third, the, 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 you know, this week we will have the Lancet uh, publish our declaration. The Lancet will publish our declaration. Um, Next week, and I hope this podcast will come up before that, we will have a global summit to end pandemics. This is the second one. The first one was a private matter a few months ago. This one will be public. Most of it will be public. uh, With sessions on many different topics, misinformation, disinformation, community action, um, and uh, the involvement of, of young people, of children, um, and, uh, will be present in the program. There'll be opportunities to get together. We're just in process of announcing a reunion of end coronavirus network, ECV. Mm-hmm. And we're looking forward to people coming and getting together and um, figuring out our uh, how we can uh, bring this to a more positive close. Now, uh, I want to run back to a couple things you said. You, you mentioned two things that run really against the the status quo. Um, the first is is on vaccination, and yeah, that that's the idea that a lot of um, political bodies are leaning on really hard is that they they put all their eggs in one basket and 
they have worked very well to a certain extent. And of course, the, the production and uh, uh, distribution of all the vaccines worked out much better than I would have anticipated a year and a half ago. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's not going to fix everything, it, it appears at this point in time. But that's still what many are selling and what many are leaning on. What do you think is going to happen if when it becomes more apparent that that's as fractured and as, as, as uh, you know, feeble a promise as, as it is? Because it already the, the, the issue of vaccina- vaccination has become so very divisive and uh, very unfortunately. Uh, no. So what, what do you foresee happening when, you know, if that's really starts to, to crumble in front of them? Well, first of all, it has. I mean, a lot of the public is already aware that the vaccines are not the solution. That doesn't mean that they aren't a part of the solution and are an important part of the solution. Indeed. Um, uh, but rather than focusing on, you know, the the places that have been leaning into the vaccines as the one method, I do think it's it's helpful to step back and look at what's happening globally. About 30% of global cases are actually located in just the UK and the US right now. The UK has about 10% of global cases. The US, as of about a week ago, had 20%. And testing's low in the US right now. And yeah, Yeah. and people can point at other places and say other places may not be reporting all the cases, but indeed the US is not even testing many of the cases in in people. Um, and, And when cases are high, people tend to not be able to test all the cases, we know that. Um, The contrast is that in much of the rest of the world, cases are much, much lower, right? That, right, the U.S. and the U.S. has about 4% of the global population. And the U.K. has less than 1%, about 0.85% of the global population. So the U.K. is probably a little bit more than 10% right now of global cases in the U.S., uh, somewhat more than that, um, then that means that much of the world has has fewer cases. And indeed, um, right, we have about 20%, it's about 18%, more precisely, is just China. And they have essentially no community cases in a population of 1.4 billion people. Mm-hmm. India, with about the same population, just slightly less, um, has about 15,000 cases per day. And most of those cases are located in just one state. So if you take out a few states, what's happening in the rest of the country? And the answer is over half a billion people, about 600 million people live in states with less than 20 cases per day. And people think that, you know, maybe they're not testing, but when you have very few cases, the the positivity rate is way, way down. And they're testing 100,000 cases in states that have uh, less than 20 cases per day, 100,000 tests per day. So, um, So they may be missing a few, but there are not many cases there. And, um, And so then if we look at the next 20% of case of, 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 of low case countries, uh, there is actually less than there is in India. There's about 10,000 cases per day. So in 60% of the world, we only have 25,000 cases per day. And that's half of what's happening in the UK, right? So if you look at the overall situation of the world, it's very skewed. And some of the places which had horrendous outbreaks and, you know, there was a lot of loss of life. And we surely don't consider the time in which the governments took their actions at that time to be very effective 
in the response. But what's happened is that in these countries, what they've been doing is they've been ramping up vaccination, but they've been keeping other restrictions. Mm -hmm. Like in Japan, now the cases are way down. Just a couple of months ago was the Olympics and the cases were very high. But right now they're down to a couple of hundred. I can look at the exact number, but it's of order a couple of hundred cases per day. Um, and let's just take a look at that. So Japan has 236 cases today. I assume that that's end of the cases there. Their seven day average is, is only, um, is 334, so it's lower now, it's still going down. But their peak was at 23,000. So that's a huge decline. And the peak was just in August 28th. So we're talking about two months later, dramatic decline. It just shows that you can really change things if you want. What happened is the prime they changed their prime minister because they were unhappy about the uh, the priority that the prime minister gave to economy versus health. And so the new prime minister has a higher priority on health. They ramped up vaccination dramatically and they're diligently doing masking and reasonably ex one can expect other some other restrictions. But we even don't know whether you know, super diligent masking plus vaccination might itself be enough mm -hmm. to stop the outbreak. Because again, you know, I, I don't think that that's quite enough, but Japan may be showing that it's possible. And uh, I would expect that they're doing some other precautions as well. Um, but the main thing is that uh, with the dramatically lower number of cases, the idea that we cannot confront this virus successfully in its Delta variant form, I think is, is misrepresented. We have some counter examples with what's happened in New Zealand, but in New Zealand, they had an outbreak in a motorcycle gang. It's involved in the drug trade in the worst part of Auckland and they just, you know, despite a, a six week lockdown, they couldn't gain control of it. But the question becomes, what's the next thing that you should be doing in order to gain control of the outbreak? Um, and there are lots of tools that are available today. Mass testing. I mean, they did a lot of testing, but mass testing is different. Um, it's testing everybody and making sure that you're like China did 10 million tests in a day mm -hmm. in order to stop an outbreak in, in a city. Um, and, and we have all kinds of, you know, high quality masks and even pappers that are usable for people, low cost powered air purifying respirators that provide better safety than masks. Um, some of them are not expensive. Um, now the, the, the market value of, of one that I've looked at is about 50 or $60, but wholesale they're $15 each and they're reusable. So they're not expensive, mm -hmm. but the point is that there are lots of choices about what we can do if we are intent on achieving elimination. And if we're creative about what we can be doing. Um, so there's Japan. Uh, we can look at Argentina that's way down in cases. There are countries in Africa that are way down in cases. And again, everybody is worried that somebody else is not doing all the tests. But when the cases are low is the time when you actually have much more reliability and not when the cases are high. So overall, looking at the world, it's the countries 
that have abandoned the restrictions in favor of vaccination alone that are suffering the worst situation. Even in other countries of Europe, aside from the UK, the situation is better. France is doing is regular masking. Um, other countries have more restrictions than the UK does. Um, with the exception of a few countries, they try to relax restrictions. It doesn't work, and then they they go back to restrictions. There is no fantasy world. It's the world that we live in uh, that we need to confront. But uh, many cling to a lot of fantasy worlds, and that that was the next uh, point that that is written in in the the declaration that sort of goes against another status quo. Uh, that I wanted to bring up. So I'll just uh, read what you have written here. Uh, Despite the manifest success of this approach, many governments rejected it outright. And and after repeated lockdowns and substantial losses to life and economy, these governments now speak of learning to live with the virus. Now, that idea of learning to live with the virus, um, there are definitely a lot of people who... look at that concept and see that there's something awry and see that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They're not, might not be too sure what to do about it, but um, they don't quite understand it. But unfortunately there's, there are a lot of people that think that's what we need to do is just, you know, not think about it. You know, we have to, life goes on and continue with that. And, and there's, there's a lot of uh, public officials where that's, that's become their mantra. We, we have to learn to live with this, which is vague, and they don't really elaborate on what specifically that entails. So why do you think that so many people have taken this approach, and how is it actually sold so well? Uh, this is a key question. So, so part of it is the natural inclination of people, right? before When the pandemic started, and this is something that we talked about a lot at the beginning, people didn't believe that their lives could change, right? There was this assumption that that we wouldn't be affected. They'd never experienced a disease becoming important, a new disease becoming important in a way that affected our lives. The same acceptance of the current status quo as being the future is built into sort of people's expectations about the world. So now we have the disease, so we'll still have the disease next year and the following year and the following year. And and the point is that the dynamics says otherwise. Uh, We do have a choice. And in fact, like I said, in Japan, within two months, the cases went down um, by almost two orders of magnitude. In fact, it's it's basically the factor of a hundred. Now, one could even do it faster if one wanted to, but to have in two months it going down by a factor of a hundred is huge. Um, so, so the question is, why do we accept it as being the status quo? And and the other reason is that. It requires a social decision. And and people are, believe, you know, even if they themselves would do something, would you, you know, do something, the, the, the four to six week lockdown, right? The four to six week lockdown was the way that we were advocating to get rid of this disease. And Delta makes it harder, but vaccines make it easier. We're basically back where we were at the beginning. Um, Now, maybe there are tough circumstances like motorcycle gangs involved in the drug trade, but but most places in the world could, could do it in four to six weeks. And then maybe it takes a few more weeks to, to, to relax restrictions, which is what we said from the beginning. Um, That's not a lot of time. We've been doing this for 20 months. So maybe someone would say, yeah, I would be willing to do that. But those guys over there, boy, they wouldn't do it. And if they don't do it, then we can't do it. Mm. Um, 
But the answer to that is also that this is a narrative that we've been fed. This idea of conflict in society has been a press narrative. The press lives on controversy. That's how they sell their newspapers or their TV shows. And um, and they amplify the extremes. It's just recently been that they've started to say, yeah, you know, everybody really wants masks because that would give safety for their children. The vast majority of people really want that. And it's true. The vast majority of people today want their children to be safe. They want their schools to be safe. There is a radical fringe that is advocating that children are somehow don't have to be kept safe. But that's really not a very common view. But they're very vocal. Mm -hmm. And the press amplifies them, which gives them all the more reason to be vocal. Mm -hmm. So so the, the first thing to do is to recognize that most people are reasonable. Um, they may not agree with everything that you think. You know, one group doesn't agree with the other group. And that's okay. But that's different from agreeing about safety, about the importance of safety, the importance of taking precautions, and the importance of taking action to stop this pandemic, which most people would do. So, so, the, so that's one of the reasons. But the other reason is that, again, there is this major economic force in society that has a very short-term view that says, you know, I really want people to come into my restaurant today so that I can, you know, make more money, pay my bills, pay off my debt, whatever it is. Um, and, and that imperative uh, undermines itself, right? Because what we've seen is that it disrupts society. And, and the idea that you can somehow convince people to go to a restaurant and eat works only in a very shallow way for a short amount of time. Um, if people get sick, um, surely if they die, but, but more generally, people actually learn that it's not safe. Mm -hmm. the, the, the pretend world of, you know, hey, come on my vacation, you'll go lie on the beach in some beautiful, sandy country with some willing partner, uh, because that's the picture that we're going to show you on the TV. Um, that isn't a reality that persists. Um, when people get sick, when family members have disability, uh, when the healthcare costs go through the roof, uh, when the um, uh, value of a salary doesn't make up for the harm that is being caused by going to work, when the supply chain is disrupted because there aren't truckers or garbage collectors or, or shippers um, or capacity in the port, because of longshoremen um, who are either sick or have decided that it's not worth it for them to go to work. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening. And that was happening. So this wishful thinking is, is not just of the people who want to go to the restaurant, but of the restaurateurs who believe that they can somehow get back to normal by convincing people to go to the restaurant. Um, and so Ultimately, the real question is how long are we going to allow this to happen? And my hope is that there will be the leaders in the world. Um, uh, I don't know, but, you know, again, India suffered tremendously. And, and as much as we want to hold them, you know, leaders accountable, what seems to be happening is that a lot of people don't want that to happen again. 
and they are taking quite strong action in different states. Now that cases are down, and they are far down, like at the level of one per 10 million in cases, and less. There's a, Bihar has 100 million people and they only have like four cases yesterday or something like that. Oh, wow. So one per 25 million people. It's not that far from elimination, um, but it, it's a different thing. You have to make sure that you are preventing growth of a new outbreak, if there is a new variant, if there are people who are traveling or whatever. So you really have to be on top of things. Um, and, and I know that in Bihar, they're doing very strong vaccination program right now uh, in order to make sure that they have the best protection there. And that doesn't mean, uh, by the way, vac people who are vaccinated in India are told that they, all of the other restrictions still apply to them. Mm -hmm. um, so so there, is, there is hope that India might actually achieve elimination. If it did, it would be tremendous because it would serve as an example, not just of a place that achieved elimination, but a place that achieved elimination after experiencing a huge outbreak. And, and I have less confidence in Japan because they seem to be changing policies towards you know, opening up, even though the cases are down, the next wave will happen. South Africa is way down. One would hope that they might do it. They are, you know, the point is that what you have to do is you have to have a societal memory that says, you know, Last January, we were in good shape and we relaxed restrictions and it was terrible. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure that the same thing doesn't happen this time. And so how do you change that mindset? Because that's sort of what's happened in my country and your country. And yeah. like, like I, I'm, I think you're pretty optimistic and I'm always really pessimistic, but like I, I, I worry about a scenario if if India did, you know continued to do well and did even you know it really did achieve some modicum of elimination if in uh, the west uh that just sort of gets ignored and and was sort of what you alluded to earlier with you know things happening in other places you know for some delusional reason th people think it doesn't translate to other places and maybe there's even pressure from also the intransigent minority that you alluded to before uh impacting public policy where even if somewhere like india does see a lot of success that it might just get ignored yeah i mean again i mean people are willing to impose laws right now there's basically forced vaccination in the u.s right people are losing their jobs if they don't vaccinate um, and, and why is it just vaccination that is being forced, right? I mean, you have laws about speed, speed, speeding on the road. I mean, and, and anyway, you know, the, you don't have to have everybody on board in order to achieve elimination. You know, the people who continue to get infected, you know, that the, the, their transmission can be limited both, you know, in multiple ways. But, but again, the point is the following. If India achieved elimination, it would serve as an example to others. And maybe the U.S. would be the last place on earth to get to elimination. It's possible. And you said that I'm optimistic, but really what the point is, is to realize that there is this other place which says that there is a possibility of decision i don't know what people will decide to do mm -hmm. i can't tell you my my the models that i use are not good enough mm -hmm. to figure that out 
But even if it's more likely that people won't do it, if there is a possibility that people will do it, we can give it a chance. And if all of the United States doesn't act first, it doesn't mean that some places in the United States can't act. The essential unit of action is the local community. And so we have a choice at the community level. And at the community level, people are much more uniform than across the country. So whether it's a right-wing community or a left-wing community, the community can get together and say, I don't want this disease. And take action. So whether it's a small town in Vermont, in, one of the, in the state that has had the greatest success, mm-hmm. or it's a small town in Nebraska, um, the decision about whether we want to have this disease can be made by the people of that community and forget what everything else that's going on. They have to protect themselves. And, and there's always a possibility of, of, um, of supporting each other in ways that um, enable us to be safer during this pandemic. And I think that's super important. Individual safety, household and family safety. Um, the longer the pandemic lasts, the more we have to be careful not the less, because of the ruin problem, right? There's a low probability eventually you get smacked, mm-hmm. right? So, so what you need to do is to reduce the probability of getting infected as things get longer and to get together with people so that you can protect each other and to create safe, we have to create safe spaces, safe shared spaces, um, whether they're schools, whether they're workplaces. Um, There are a number of universities that have really put a lot of work into making their spaces safe. Um, My colleague, uh, Matthias Schneider in Germany got his university to create a green zone. It's based upon testing and other things, but it's been quite successful. And there are some places in the US that have been quite successful. So local decision-making to achieve elimination can help. And every time we make one area safe, we increase the ability of others to see that it's possible. And, um, and, and, And ultimately, people won't aspire unless they themselves have hope. And so one of the real problems with the message that we're seeing with the live with the virus mantra is is not that it's true. That's not the issue. It's that it's working. The reason why that's so important for those financial interests to emphasize is that they're worried that people will actually do it, Mm -hmm. achieve elimination. And that is scary enough to them that they're trying to convince us that we shouldn't do it. Why else would they say it? Why do people, why does the press spend so much time saying we can't do elimination? No, that's not possible. And the reason is very clear because if we do it, we might be successful, Mm -hmm. but we will be successful locally disrupting some of their ideas about going to the, Bahamas or to other places where we all spend money on vacations. The current imperative is first and foremost to protect ourselves, our families, and when we can get together with others in shared action, our communities. And we are planning to engage in this community-based activity much more at the World Health Network uh, because I've always believed, not not because of this, but 
but this is informing this. I've always believed that the only way to fight pandemics is when the community itself decides to do so. Now, one more thing, and then we should probably wrap up. Yeah. Um, is there any last note that you'd like to to send to anybody to encourage them to sort of persevere in, in wanting to see some sort of change? Because you, as you alluded to before, like we've done a lot, particularly over the last century, to improve people's safety and quality of life. And a lot of that hasn't been easy, whether it's um, battling the lead industry in, in court or when Ralph Nader, you know, wanted to uh, Im improve the auto, uh, automotive safety and anything of that sort. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of work and, you know, the, everything in the pandemic just hasn't been going very well. And it just seems like it's one catastrophic approach after another. Uh, so with all that, do you, would you, what would you say to encourage people just to keep going and, and keep trying to, to see some sort of change? I think, I think we should all recognize that the challenges that we're facing now are not the pandemic. The challenges that we're facing now are the society that we live in. And the opportunity that we have is not just to defeat the pandemic, but to change the world in a better way, to make the world be one where lives will be improved even better than they were before the pandemic because of exactly what you're saying. There are many, many challenges that we're facing. And, and the pandemic is uh, the, the, if you will, the canary in the coal mine, pointing not to the disease, but pointing to the fact that our governance systems, uh, our institutions have either um, uh, you know, have, are not the right ones, whether because they've become more rigid or whether because they've become uncaring because they represent the wrong interests. Um, they're very good at deceiving us, and we've seen that, and the societal conflicts are often about government, are really mostly about the fact that government no longer represents the people. Uh, the, the, the loss of the social compact is, is clear. So the question is, how do we confront that? And the answer is we have to care enough in order to do so. And if we don't care enough in order to change, we will suffer the consequences of loss of quality of life instead of its improvement that has to do with the loss of the value of life instead of making life be valuable. And, and making life be valuable starts not from saying, you know, everybody has value, but really recognizing the value of each and every person um, in the society. So, so thank you for, for doing this podcast. I think the first podcast you did, I also was interviewed, um, if I remember correctly. Oh, it was the, it was pretty early on. It was the third, but yeah, that the was the third way, one that, that was, that was way back in March. Yeah. Way back in March. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I, I hope that uh, this is the beginning of the next stage of our efforts. Um, and, and the fact that we haven't uh, yet succeeded should not be understood uh, as being an indication of what is to come. We have, uh, there are good reasons uh, to persevere and there are good reasons uh, to, to be successful. I fully agree. Thanks again, Yanir. Hey, everybody. Me again. Just have a quick end piece here regarding the information discussed in this episode. So if you are interested in finding out more or want to spark up some efforts of your own or possibly link up with others, 
Join the World Health Network Summit happening on November 3rd to 4th. That's if you're listening to this episode before the beginning of November 2021. Details for the summit are on the World Health Network website at worldhealthnetwork.global slash summit dash info. The link will be included in the show notes. You can also explore the World Health Network website, projects and resources sections for information on safer schools, ventilation, graphics, and more. Also, keep an eye out for the declaration coming out in the Lancet on the 29th of October, 2021, as we discussed. All these details will also be included in the show notes. Cheers again, guys. Thanks for listening to the show, everybody. There'll be more episodes coming for you in the future. Be sure to check out ncoronavirus.org and worldhealthnetwork.global for more information on the organization. Thanks to Michelle from Make Good Together for doing the graphics for the show. And a huge thanks to Tracy, the noble producer of the show. If you listen to the show on either YouTube or podcast format, well, they are available on both. And be sure to like and subscribe and comment on those. All the best. Till next time.